You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 172. Obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Anonymous. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Well, guys, today on the show, we have director Joe Wright. Now, Joe is known for directing films like Pride and Prejudice, Atonement, one of my favorites, Hannah, The Soloist, starring Jamie Foxx and Robert Downey Jr., The Darkest Hour, starring, of course, Academy Award winner Gary Oldman, and his newest film, Cyrano, starring Peter Dinklage. Now, Joe opened up a lot in this conversation with me about his process, about, you know, feeling not, uh, you know, having imposter syndrome, which so many amazing artists go through, how he deals with it, how he deals with uh, problems on set, how he works, his his whole process. And it's just a really, really interesting conversation. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Joe Wright. I'd like to welcome to the show, Joe Wright. How are you doing, Joe? I am uh, excellent. Thank you. I'm very well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've I've been a fan of your work for quite some time, so I'm excited to kind of dive into the weeds with you on on, a, on your career. Uh, so first and foremost, how did you and why did you want to get into this insane business? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I think I'd like to be able to tell you a story that clearly illustrates a particular moment in my life when I knew I was going to be a filmmaker. Um, But it was more incremental than that. I knew, I always knew that I wanted to be in drama somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, My parents were puppeteers um, uh, and they did, you know, puppet shows for for adults and kids. Um, And so I grew up in this kind of fantasy world of fairy tales. uh, which was no preparation at all for the harsh reality of uh, <laughs> contemporary life. Right. Um, I went to uh, a drama club after school um, where you paid the equivalent of like 10 cents a lesson and uh, and you went and did improvisation workshops with other kids from the local area. Um, that was uh, an important kind of stepping stone. Um, I... Uh, I hung around in a pub 
in Islington in London um, that was, um, you know, a lot of actors went there and writers and people, and there was a little theatre upstairs where people put on shows. Um, but running parallel to that was a was a passion for film from, you know, the age of six. I remember asking my mum how films were made, and she uh, happened, weirdly, to have a long strip of cartridge paper um, and we we drew a picture, or she drew a picture of a prince and a princess, and then divided that um, to another square. And there was a dragon, and the dragon came and stole the princess, and and told uh, the story of George and the dragon. And then we we cut a hole in the lid of a shoebox and wound this paper through this aperture. And she said, "That's um, that's how you make films. It's uh, it's storytelling." um uh with images one after the other um and and i guess that kind of set my whole imagination on fire at an early age was there a film was there a film that lit your fire there was an idea to be an actor i thought i might be an actor you see Mm -hmm. and and my plan was to be a very famous actor (laughs) obviously Um, uh obviously because you're not going to plan to be a you know out of work actor um uh and and then through acting i was going to I was going to move into directing. Um, however, um, I sat around on my ass for, you know, um, uh, a year waiting for the phone to ring and nothing much happened. And then my dad uh, had a stroke and I thought, OK, I need to do something with my life. So I went to art school and at art school I was, you know, um, I gave up acting and I, and I just started making short films. Um, to answer your question, there are many films that that influenced me along the way. Um, I think David Lean's Great Expectations was one of those, um, mm. especially the power of the of the graveyard scene and when Pip runs into Magwitch. Um, and then, you know, when I was about fifteen, um, in the same summer, I uh, saw for the first time um, Taxi Driver and Blue Velvet. <laughs> Oh Jesus! Um, and uh, and and I I thought you know I thought Blue Velvet was a comedy actually, um, <laughs> but I but, but I, I watched and rewatched those films over that summer, and I think they really had a huge impact on my understanding of what a director does. Actually, that's that's amazing. Now, how you say you were doing shorts? There's a short called Crocodile Snap. How did you get that short off the ground? Get the money? Get the everything to kind of put that thing together? Um. Well, I that was after I left college, and I'd I'd made a short film at college, which um, had won a prize, and the guy who gave out the prizes for Fuji film, uh, the guy, he was, his name was Jeremy Howe. And um, he wrote to me saying he liked my movie, you know, uh, my short film. And uh, he ran a, a, a BBC series called 10 by 10, which was 10 short films of 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I um, called his receptionist um, every day, bugging her, um, and I think I bugged her to the extent that in the end she told me um, where he was having a meeting that day. Um, and he, she said, if you want to talk to him, just go down there and talk to him. Um, and I turned up and I hung around. It was the Royal Institute of British Architects. And I hung around this very imposing institution uh, for uh, three or four hours until he finally came out. And I said, um, Jeremy, sir, I, I need to talk to you about this film. And and, uh, um, and he said, well, I'm, I'm very late, but you've got between here and Googe Street uh, subway station to uh, to pitch. And um, and so that four or five minutes of that walk um, really changed my life because um, I managed to persuade him to let me do this short film. And listen, I'm talking about three thousand dollars probably uh, right. budget you know? but to me that was an astronomical amount of money and inconceivable for me to to get hand my hands on um and he uh, he commissioned this short film and um and then that 
um, uh, got nominated for a BAFTA. And, and from there, I was kind of on the very early stages of some kind of ladder. Now, how did you make the jump from a $3,000 short to directing Pride and Prejudice, which is a bit more than $3,000, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. Well, I was I was very lucky. I mean, I always tell sort of young filmmakers who are trying to figure out how to how to get into the business, how to gain experience. Um, I always tell them to hang around actors um, and basically to <laughs> find if there's a if there's a little fringe theater, um, if there's an actor's workshop, if there's anything that involves actors putting on shows, telling stories, that's your best bet. And as I mentioned before, there was this pub in Islington called the Old Red Lion. Um, and uh, drinking in this pub um, was this incredibly important character called Kathy Burke, who is an actor and director and writer. She won the Palm Door for Gary Oldman's Nil by Mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very influential. Um, and every time I made a short film, I'd give her a VHS copy of my short film. And without telling me, every time I did that, she would pass that on to this producer friend at the BBC. And so one day I got a call out of the blue saying, um, will you come in to the BBC to meet uh, Catherine Waring, who is this producer? Um, and I went along and it was in the days where you could still smoke in offices and you, I couldn't <laughs> see her through the mist of tobacco smoke. Um, uh, although it did smell a bit odd. Um, uh, and, um, and through the smoke, uh, I heard this raspy voice say, um, so would you like to do a three part drama for the BBC? And I, I could have, I, you know, my, <laughs> my heart jumped out of my mouth. And I tried to play it very cool and said, yeah, well, it depends on the script. Um, <laughs> Lessons for everyone learning. If you're in the room yeah. and they offer you something like this, you got to act cool. You can't just lose your, your, your crap right there. <laughs> you can't lose your crap right there. So, um, so I said, it depends on the script. And, um, and you know, she, um, she sent me the, the first episode and I was actually bowled over by it. It was a really beautiful piece of, uh, writing um, called Nature Boy, and uh, and I was suddenly directing at the age of twenty six. I was directing uh, three one hour episodes, um, so three hours of television, uh, a budget of I think three point four million pounds. Um, wow. And so that was a huge steep learning curve. And then I made about fourteen hours of television. Um, I did about, yeah, I did three or four TV projects, um, each one kind of bigger than the last. Um, and, uh, and then one day I was asked to go and meet Working Title to talk about Pride and Prejudice. So, yeah, so it wasn't like, uh, oh, I just made a $3,000 movie and they just give you Pride and Prejudice. You, you had built a career. Yeah. And it was great. It was great because people used to say, wow, you're, you know, this, this is a first time film director. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> as if I was somehow, you know, blessed from um, from heaven with this kind of ability to make, you know, to know how to make movies. At that um, level, at that level. <laughs> at that level, it was very hard, hard one. Um, and I and I didn't tell anyone that really I was quite, you know, reasonably <laughs> experienced in TV. Uh, I, I, I let them believe the myth of, of, of um, talent. Uh, but um, but yeah, it was uh, the teacher at that 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 um, improvisation workshop uh, always used to say it's ninety nine percent ninety nine percent perspiration and one percent inspiration, um, and I think uh, that was that was it. Uh, very very true. Now you've worked with some remarkable actors in your career. How do you? approach or do you have any advice on directing actors because you've been able to you know pull or collaborate on some amazing performances yeah i mean i think i think um i think the fact that i used to act as mm. a kid um uh means that i i never 
I never shrouded the craft in this kind of mystic reverie. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. People, people think of actors as almost being like witches or, you know, um, <laughs> warlocks. Um, this strange kind of alchemy happens and somehow they're able to do this thing, shapeshift. It's, it's, a, it, it's certainly an art. Um, acting is certainly an art, but um, it's also a craft. Mm-hmm. Um, and I approach actors um, uh, as craftspeople, as collaborators, um, I am completely open with them about the process. Um, I, I don't, I don't expose my fears too much to them because uh, they need bolstering. They need to believe that you believe, um, even when you don't. Um, but I, but I share the process. I tell them exactly what the story is that we're trying to, you know, trying to tell. Um, I make them a part of it, and I, I don't bullshit them either excuse language um uh i don't i don't try and kind of you know i think they often get infantilized um right uh, and if if you treat actors like children they'll behave like children um uh where if you give them the respect of intelligence um then uh then they'll reciprocate uh intelligently um and yeah, and I think it's it's really it's really just talking straight to them, and not and not kind of you know I remember I remember you know and there are tricks you know but I remember talking to Kira Knightley on on um, Pride and Prejudice and and uh, and saying listen you're head of department right the, there's the, there's the camera department there's the art department there's the acting department and it's a department like any other department in telling this story and you as the lead actor are the head of department. Um, and therefore, as head of department, any new department member that comes in on a day to do a couple of lines, your job is to make them feel welcome and ask them if they're okay and support them. You know, um, uh, And that was a, a trick that really worked because it, it, it grounded her and it meant that every supporting actor that came in therefore supported her um, because she had reached out as a, you know, as the head of department. That's a, that's an amazing. I've never heard that that technique before. That's a really great technique to I use. I can't exactly tell Gary Oldman that, but Kira was only eighteen. So <laughs> <laughs> it also, I mean, the other thing with actors is that generally um, uh, they are all different, and yeah. you have to figure out uh, what makes them tick, um, and then. Um, you know, and then and and then play to their specific, um, uh, yeah, strengths and stuff. Yeah. So, so do you? I always tell act. I always tell filmmakers this is that as a director, you really need to keep, create a safe space for the actor. If the actor doesn't feel that they're in a safe space where they can really go on out on a limb, you know, with their craft, if they feel they have to protect themselves, that's when the problems start. Is that is that your experience? I think that's a brilliant piece of advice. Absolutely. I think, I think, you know, um, uh, we're all exposed. We're all, you know, uh, s- scared of being judged. Um, am I a good director? Am I a good boom operator? You know, um, am I doing okay? But for the actor there in front of the camera, and that's a whole nother level of oh. vulnerability. Um, and therefore you have to support them and, and and create that safe space, which is one of the reasons why I do rehearsals. I do a lot of rehearsals prior okay. to shooting, two or three weeks um, uh, for a movie, and and that is partly about learning each other's rhythms and so on. But it's also about just getting to know each other and getting to a point where they feel, um, yeah, safe, looked after, you know, Com- and, and um, comfortable and comfortable with each other. Because if there's going to be yeah. any issues, I'd rather be in rehearsal than uh, as far as personality conflicts or te- techniques one's method one's not method things like that you've got to figure all that stuff out in a much cheaper environment <laughs> in a much cheaper yeah, yeah. Uh, your cheapest days are your rehearsal days um but also you know two other things i think it's really important to like your actors so when you're casting you have to 
figure out whether you like this person uh, because you're going to have to talk to them a lot. And I find it personally, I find it difficult to talk to people I don't like. <laughs> um, so one, do I like them? And two, do I respect their intelligence? Because there's a, there's a kind of myth that goes around the, you know, the airhead actors. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, uh, the, the most successful actors I've ever met are the most intelligent people I've ever met, you know, um, Agreed. be that, you know, Tom Cruise is incredibly smart, you know, um, uh, Nicole Kidman, incredibly smart, Gary Oldman, incredibly smart. These people are really, really smart. Um, they're not, you know, um, and intelligence as in, uh, you know, as with music or science or politics plays an enormous part in the ability to act now uh do you storyboard by any chance because i mean you have you, you you paint on such big canvases uh i storyboard when the sequence involves very specific ideas of montage uh when i'm interested in how one image cuts to another i'll draw those two pictures and put them next to each other on a piece of paper and see how they work together um, if it's a long developing shot or a long steady cam shot, then um, I don't uh, because I don't find it useful. But I storyboard everything I do. And often also what I'll do is I'll get plans of the set and then just mark out diagrams of the camera move, the direction, the light direction in particular, um, so that my DP can pre-light confidently, knowing that that's the direction I'm going to be looking in. Um, so I plan uh, very, very carefully, but not always storyboarding. Very cool. Now, there's one film that you made that is is one of my favorites. And when it came out, I saw the trailer and it blew me away. Hannah. I, oh. I absolutely loved Hannah. And it was kind of like a revelation when it came out. It was a, obviously a big, very big success. It even spawned off uh, a very successful television show uh, at this Ooh. point. How did you get involved with Hannah? And and how did you bring that um, that energy that that movie has? It's so so wonderful. Um, thank you. Um, Hannah happened because Sersha Ronan uh, called me up and said, uh, "I want to make this film, Hannah, and I want you to direct it." Um, and I was like, "Great! All right, then let's do that." Um, <laughs> it was. Was it? I mean, I'd worked obviously with Hannah on Atonement. Sure. Uh, I mean, no, I'd, I'd worked obviously with with Saoirse on Atonement, mm -hmm. um, and um, and she was eleven. Yeah, then. she was a kid. Um, yeah. yeah, and then she was sixteen when we made Hannah, and it was something that you know that that Focus Features had sent her, um, and I guess she liked working with me and and asked me to asked me to do it, and um, I read the script. And it was interesting, actually, that 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 process, because there was this, the, the script I read, there was two credited writers, one of whom was a guy called Seth Lockhead. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, the script was really uneven. It was really patchy. There were moments of kind of surreal um, flights of fantasy that I'd never encountered in a kind of certainly not in an action movie. Um, uh, this strange, almost sort of hallucinatory experience, mm -hmm. um, and then there were the there were bits that were like purely procedural kind of um, action spy thriller um, uh, stuff, and so I kind of questioned what that was about, and discovered that actually the studio had been scared of Seth Lockhead's origin original script, which was the kind of more hallucinatory thing. Um, and that they'd brought on another writer to write the more procedural stuff and kind of tame it down. So I, I, I basically went back to Seth and he and I worked on developing his flavor and his ideas more fully, uh, but also kind of um, practically so that it was actually shootable. Um, yeah, and, the, and, 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 I, and I bring, you know, I, I work very closely with writers. Every film I make is extremely personal. Um, and uh, and so, um, a, 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 
there were elements that I was, you know, there was stuff. I was angry at the world at the time. Something had happened to a friend of mine, mm. um, uh, a woman who had been, um, yeah, something bad had happened to her. And, um, and so the film was a kind of <laughs> innocent outsider's view of this crazy world in which she was born into. And, and I guess those, that, that horrible thing that happened to your friend and this script at the same time kind of came together at that moment where that energy and that anger you might have been perfectly fit that, that film. I kind of, I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm, um, I think things seem to, if you allow them to, things seem to happen at the right moment. Right. I'm not much, you know, I'm not, I don't really, um, uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm not really into the idea of an interventionist God, but I do believe that if you get into the flow of things, things happen as they should. Yeah, I've I've been given the advice is like don't push the river. The river is going yeah. to. It, the river is flowing with, with or without you. You trying to push it yeah. is not. It's only going to make you tired. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It makes you really. I've tried it. Oh, we all have. <laughs> Believe me, I've, tried it. I've spent a lot of my career trying it. And, You're uh, like, can we get this fair. one little project pushed a little bit more? Can we get just a little bit more money? Just let it, just let it happen. Let it go. Let it yeah. go. Now, um, as directors, you know, we always find. I'm sorry. As they say in Frozen, just let it go. Just you read my mind. <laughs> you read my mind. <laughs> you must have kids too. Oh, I oh God, thank God they're over that phase. Oh my god! Those are the phase. Oh anyway, my god! Go anyway, Sorry. anyway, Sorry. anyway. Um, so, as directors, there's always a day that we have that the world. We feel like the world is coming crashing down around us on a shoot day or in the middle of a movie, and and oh my god, how are we going to get through this? Whether that be the camera fell into the lake, we're losing the light, the actor broke their leg, <laughs> something happens that you feel like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. What was that day for you? And how did you overcome that day? Is there a day in, in your, in your career that you can, that you can say publicly? <laughs> usually, usually. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, it usually happens at about four o'clock. Um, uh, you know, every day, every day, <laughs> every day. Uh, you think you're going along fine. You know, you've, you've started the morning with, um, uh, confidence in your plan um and uh and maybe you've taken a little bit too long over rehearsals or setting up that shot or this shot and and uh you've got you know three scenes to get through and and then suddenly you go oh god it's lunchtime and i've only done you know half a scene or one scene um and then everyone's a bit slow coming back from lunch because they've had the apple pie and custard um and and you're trying to get through and then at about four o'clock you go oh you know, um, uh, oh no, I have, you know, two hours left and I've still got to do this three page scene. Right. Um, how am I gonna, um, ever get through the day? Um, and you get through it by, um, by economizing basically. Um, you yeah. get through it by figuring out what the essentials of that scene are and right. shooting that um and and often those end up being the most interesting scenes um because you haven't had the luxury of of you know um uh over articulation um uh so so I think often, you know, and and in a way, I'm I'm beginning to try and apply that overall to the films I make, you know, to to just what are the essentials, what's important, and and stripping away the kind of um, the 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 decoration, if you like, um, uh, and and really listening to to the story. Um, so that's a kind of general answer for you. I mean, certainly the day that. Um, Mount Etna erupted whilst we were shooting the battle sequence of Cyrano. Uh, that was a fairly cata catastrophic day. You know, that was a day where I was like, I would say so. so. The, only, the only solution that day was to pick up the camera case and run. Um, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> the hell with the day. The hell with your day. You know, I, yeah, uh, I have no other advice for, for for young filmmakers who happen to be facing an, uh, a volcano erupting other than to say run. <laughs> Forget the shot. I mean, if you can get the shot, maybe let the camera run for five more seconds, but then run. Yeah, and then run. And then, and then run. And, and, and protect your head as well because there are projectile stones being fr- Well, you were that close, huh? You were really there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we shot a sequence in Sono. <laughs> is a, um, well, oh, I mean, Jesus, I laugh now. Right. Um, but at the time, I was literally crying. Um, we had planned to shoot the, the battle sequence at 16,000 feet at the, uh, oh. near the summit of Mount Etna. Um, and four days prior to shooting, um, uh, uh, there was a, a, a um, unprecedented uh, snow storm and our set got buried in two meters of snow, including the hundred foot techno that we we oh. got up there. Um, and, uh, and, and the whole thing was completely inaccessible. Um, so with only, you know, four days notice, we had to reconceive the whole very complicated sequence anyway. Uh, down to 8,000 feet. Um, and that was interesting to kind of go, okay, I've got no set. Um, I've got, you know, a bunch of guys dressed as soldiers. I've got no set. I've got a camera and a tripod, and that is literally it. Um, uh, I've got no tricks to hide behind. Uh, you know, I can't even move the camera. I've got no track because um, I'm working on a kind of vertiginous um, volcanic slope. And, and to really kind of, go all right what are the, what, what how, what do i need to tell this story what how can i tell this story with these very few uh basic tools um at my disposal um and that was that was fascinating um but yeah then the then the volcano actually erupted and, and, and that was the end of that <laughs> because i remember watching that sequence in Cyrano and i was it was i mean it was beautiful and i'm thinking to myself because in today's world, you just don't know how much is visual effects, how much is, you know, did he shoot this all on a green screen? Like, how much of no. it was real? And I'm like, when you said, because I've been at 12,000 feet, yeah. and it's, I was having problems walking. I can only imagine trying to shoot at that level. It, yeah, it's, it's just, brutal. It's, it's, it's absolutely brutal. It's like, it's absolutely brutal. But those scenes that, in Cyrano specifically, they were gore. They were beautiful. They would be, those, that, those, war sequence but now knowing the backstory behind it i'm like okay yeah. this makes sense but that's but that's the thing is and i feel that as as filmmakers if you're given to if you're if you're if you if you if i told you joe all you've got is time and money uh, which would be fun for a minute but at a certain point you're just like i need limitations i and those limitations are what help you chisel down the fat on a scene i've had it I've done it. I got time and money. I got, you know, they, they gave me, I, they gave me $180 million to make pan. Right. Uh, oh, I got, you know, all the tools I could, could possibly want. Um, and it was the biggest disaster of my career. Um, uh, whereas, you know, on a film like a uh, atonement, for instance, um, I had one day to shoot a montage sequence of the beach at Dunkirk. Um, I understood that there is no way I was going to be able to complete that sequence in a single day, given the tide coming in and out. Um, my only solution therefore, which I thought was a pretty good creative solution was to shoot the whole thing in a single Steadicam shot. Um, and that for a while was the, was the, the shot that defined my career, you know? So, Mm -hmm. um, so I do strongly, strongly believe in limitations, um, liberating us creatively and, 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 and using, you know, always having a kind of a positive solution based outlook, Mm -hmm. um, because generally what we're doing, Alex, you know, is to is to find solutions. There are a series of problems over the course of a day. Um, and our job as a, as directors is to gather these people together and marshal um, them through the through the problems by finding solutions collectively. Um, and uh, and those are creative solutions as well as practical solutions. If you're living deeply, deeply in the heart and head of the film, 
then those solutions will carry through the story and the themes that you're trying to express naturally. So, you know, as uh, when you're when you're on set, you know, especially at at the indie stage, there's a thousand questions. But I can only imagine at these hundred and eighty million dollar stages. Um, how do you? Uh, what advice would you give filmmakers dealing with that barrage? You know, young directors who are being asked every minute, "What do you think of this? What do you want to do there? How do you do this? How do you move that?" Because I mean, directing is essentially compromise, compromise, compromise. It's never what you want, yeah. but you know what I mean. So, as far as answering and dealing with that kind of hurricane, because you're in the center of a little mini hurricane on every day, as a director, yeah, how would you approach? It? I love that. I love that feeling. I love being on set. <laughs> oh um, God, yes. Uh, the two, the two very kind of practical um, suggestions I would make. Um, uh, well, I get up two hours um, uh, before having to leave um, for set, and I spend those two hours reading the script. Um, and writing a shot list every morning. I've done. Yeah. I've already done. You know, first drafts of a shot list and, and or storyboards with my DP earlier. Um, but I spend those two hours kind of very quietly contemplating what's really necessary and and what the story is that I'm t- I'm trying to tell. So that's one thing that grounds me, um, and 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 helps me keep focused. Um, and the other thing is when someone comes to you with a question, the first or an idea, which can be just as challenging sometimes, um, uh, is the first thing that comes out of your mouth is thank you. Um, And that buys you a window of time to one, um, bring bring your panic and your ego down um, and just buys you a little little window between their question or their suggestion and your answer. Um, it just kind of is a magic word that breaks things down. And then you can approach the question or the, or the suggestion with a kind of clear, clear of ego, really. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I'd say. So, uh, you I know, mean, I know that sounds naff, but it kind of works. You should it, try it. I mean, uh, people should try it. It does kind of work. Oh no, it definitely it definitely does. I mean, I always I mean, the best advice I've ever gotten on set is uh don't be a dick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> best advice Absolutely. in the business. Best advice you could get in this yeah. business. Don't be a dick. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a, that's a fundamental uh piece of advice. Now, you know, earlier in your career or I'm I'm assuming throughout your career, uh you've got to deal with rejection. How do you deal with rejection? I'm sure there's projects that you wanted to get off the ground that didn't you know, a lot of people think that like, oh, once you get to a certain level, they just constantly, you, all you got to do is make a phone call and they give you $50 million or $100 million and you just make whatever you want. And that's not your truth. You know, after talking to so many filmmakers over the years, I know that's not the truth, but there's that kind of lore in the <laughs> of, of young filmmakers thinking that, you know, people have to, to have that opportunity and they don't generally. How do you deal with those rejections? How do you keep moving forward? Well, I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, there is no final destination. Uh, you don't, you know, there is no, there's no arrival. You don't get somewhere and go, oh, great, I've I'm, made it. And I'm here. Go, I'm here and now people are going to let me make my films. Um, uh, that's certainly not my experience. I think um, I find, I find rejection really hard, actually. Mm-hmm, of um, and I haven't, and I haven't yet um found a very healthy way of dealing with it um but i you know this is all i can do right um right. making movies is all i can do i haven't got you know wealthy parents uh, to lean back on i haven't got any other source of income whatsoever um uh, it's my job um, it's my vocation and it's my uh, life and it's my heart and it's everything I I love. Um, uh, it's also a spiritual practice, I believe, but it's but it's a job, you know. Um, I got to put food on the table, um, uh, and so therefore I have to 
get up, dust myself down and go back to work. Um, uh, and that's all it is, you know. Um, it's like, okay, that didn't work. Let me try something else. Let me try something else. Let me try something else, you know. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, uh, because I don't have a choice, you know, I don't have the luxury of going, well, that didn't work. And I'm really hurt. My, my feelings are really hurt. So I'm going to just go and take five years off and sit on my dad's yacht. You know, um, that isn't an option. Um, uh, uh, so it's just about picking yourself up, dusting yourself off and keeping on going. I mean, I had a, you know, I had a terrible crisis of confidence after Pan. Um, I'm sure. I shouldn't talk about it too much, but, you know, I had a terrible crisis of confidence after that. Um, I, I uh, called up um, Afonso Caron. I said, I'm having a terrible time. Uh, um, and we talked about it. And he's someone who I thought never experienced crises of confidence. You know, he's, he's great. He's Alfonso mm-hmm. Caron. He made, mm-hmm. you know, gravity in Roma. Mm-hmm. Um, he said, oh, man, I'm having exactly the same <laughs> problem myself. He said, I'm going through the same thing. I said, oh, uh, you, you know, what, you go through that too? He goes, yes, man, I go through this too. You know, it's, it's hard. Um, uh, we all go through it. And, um, and, and we, you know, and, and and we went and, and watched a couple of early Italian near realist movies and felt much better. You know, (laughs) I think, I think practically something one can do is just go and watch the films that made you fall in love with filmmaking in the first place. Um, remind yourself of what you love about film. Yeah. Um, uh, which isn't, careerist bullshit it is the art form itself um uh and then put that into your work you know it's no it's no coincidence that having had that experience i went and made darkest hour which was essentially about this little guy who had a crisis of confidence you know his name was winston churchill but fundamentally for me it was about a guy who had a crisis of confidence um who doubted himself um as others doubted him and and so i was able to put all of that experience directly into that movie and you know i think as as artists we all have that moment especially when you're on set and i've i've uh, when i've talked to so many different directors at so many different stages of their career and it happens all the time that you have that kind of imposter syndrome you could have won an oscar Ooh. and you feel like oh my god someone's going to come in and go what are you doing here you don't belong here security Escort Joe out off the set. I mean, is we that... all have that. We all have that. The only person who doesn't have that is Inaritu. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Inaritu doesn't have that. I don't think but Cameron. From... I don't think Cameron has it either. <laughs> Maybe not Cameron. Okay, but apart from Inaritu and Cameron, everybody. Has everybody has. Exactly. Maybe everyone else is imposters. They're the only true guests in the past. <laughs> but the thing is, is that you, you know. What are you going to do? You're going to go to the party and go, oh, I'm not an imposter. I belong here. Right. And then stand there lonely because, you know, you think you're the only one that belongs. You know, it's it, 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 we all share. We're all common. We, you know, our, We're human. our similarities are far greater than our differences. Agreed 110%. And, and, that, and that's why I try to do when I do these shows and I speak to people like yourself is I want to kind of break down the myths of so many. Because when I was coming up as, as a young filmmaker, I, you know, I looked up on, on, the, on the mountain, yeah, Mount Hollywood, where Spielberg and Cameron and Lucas and Coppola and Scorsese lived. Spielberg's terrified. Spielberg's terrified it's, every day. Of course. He's terrified. He's not the man. Huh? He's worried. He worries all the time, you know. <laughs> and he's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and he's Steven Spielberg. Exactly. It, it, it's it, like, it, 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 I mean, my God. And in a way, that's what the movie Cyrano is about. Huh, see what I did there? It's about someone who, who feels like they're living in the wrong body. He's an imposter. It's about say, oh, yeah. feeling like you're different from everyone else. It's what we're... You know, it's what I'm trying to talk about in the movies is how do I fit in? 
how do I how do I communicate with other people? Hannah is about a girl trying to go, how do I fit into this world? How do I connect with other human beings? Why is it so difficult to connect? Um, why is it so difficult for me to get past my own feeling of um, lack of self-worth? Why can't I allow people to see me really for who I am? Right. Um, all of those questions, that's drama. And that's why I love making drama, you know? And what I've discovered is that I have to make the movies that I love. Um, I've tried making, you know, movies, uh, big CG movies. I've tried making movies that are, you know, twisted dark thrillers. I've tried making movies that that aren't really expressive of who I am, but uh, uh, I'm messing around with genre. I'm trying things. It was interesting, but the films that work are the films that speak of who I am as an individual. Right. And, and you could absolutely tell that. And, you know, I just happened to, I had, I had the pleasure of watching Sierra No, uh, yesterday, in fact. So it's fresh in my mind. I absolutely ad adored the film. I think it's wonderful. It's one of the best films of the year without, without question. Um, the performances are wonderful. I, how did you, how did you bring that story? What made you want to bring that story back? Because it has been told, obviously, a million times before because of Sierra No, the Birds Rack. What, what made you want to come in and throw your your twist on it? I would always have wanted to tell that story because I feel it is um, I identify with 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 Cyrano, you know I, I um, as we've talked about, I feel like uh, I don't fit in or unworthy of love, uh, <laughs> incapable of connecting with other people um my my um my insecurities my f fear of intimacy sure um are all expressed through that character um the question was that um or well, the problem was that it had been done before and so there wasn't you know an opening for me to to i, I couldn't remake the the, the nose version mm -hmm. um and then when I saw Peter Dinklage play Cyrano, and I think often a, a creatively successful movie is about the right actor in the right role at the right time, um, um, like you know Gary Oldman in, in, in Darkest Hour or Kira in, in Pride and Prejudice, um, or indeed Saoirse in, in Atonement, um, uh, seeing Pete in that role, suddenly the emotional weight of the story hit me in a way that I hadn't experienced before because however strong the suspension of disbelief might be, you're always aware that Gerard Depardieu is wearing a you know big prosthetic on the end of his face and at the end of the night he's going to take that off and go to the bar and get drunk. Um, uh, whereas with Pete, there's a immediate authenticity. You know that Pete is, is going to... Be Pete. Always be he is. He's always going to be Pete. He's 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 lived with that experience, um, and he brings the weight of that experience to that performance. And then to see him um, opposite Haley Bennett, who is so uh, um, extraordinarily womanly and mm -hmm. uh, emotional, feminine. Uh, right. And feminine and and you know she's not one of these kind of androgynous girls that kind of are completely asexual she's kind of <clears throat> she's got this extraordinary um femininity and uh and and sexuality and intelligence and um and so to see him uh, opposite her um seemed like the perfect um perfect coupling the casting was phen phenomenal enough i mean it was ph absolutely phenomenal i hope peter gets nominated because he was it's a tour de force it's an absolute tour de force uh, performance on, okay. on his part uh now i i always wanted to ask because i've never spoken to a director who's worked uh on a musical before yeah. so how do you I approach directing these large set pieces and and musical sequences because it, it was just i've just i've never directed a, a musical sequence so i don't even com consider how you would even go at that level with so many costumes and the locations and everything 
uh frankly like you would any other sequence you know um uh and and the choreography is probably the biggest difference um dance um but that is really very much like fight choreography you know um uh it all has to be very very carefully worked out and rehearsed um endlessly for weeks on end prior to shooting um all of the we made a choice to to have all of the singing happen live on set um so that there was a a level of intimacy and that there would be a fluidity between the speech um and the singing uh um so do you cut so do you cut between performances like so if someone's singing here on set and someone's are you cutting those performances or are you laying down like an adr track afterwards of them live on set no they're 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 singing live on set and that's what we're cutting with okay um uh, so they're wearing e- earwigs mm-hmm. um, so they can hear the music backing track. And if they're singing in duet with another performer, uh, we've got a temp recording of that other performer playing in their ear. Um, uh, and then when I go and shoot that other performer, I've got what we recorded on set from the first performer playing in their ear. Um, and sometimes we had live accompaniment because we wanted the kind of, you know, we wanted to be off click, as they say. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, so we could so they could be more kind of um, they could move the rhythm, the melody around and the rhythm around a little bit more. Uh, but but shooting the singing live like that enabled a much. Um, uh, a much more tender fragile Mm -hmm. uh intimate experience we're not seeing we're not hearing them through a glass panel we're not you know we're not having them talking talking and then suddenly needle drop and we're into a it's a musical um Mm -hmm. uh um it's as natural as singing along to the radio whilst you're doing the washing up and and I I saw that right away. I was like, oh, he's he's doing it that way. I was like, oh this is nice. And and when you see Peter just start singing like, you know, yeah. in the middle of like he's having a conversation and then just starts to sing naturally. Like you, w- it, it was, it was wonderfully done. It was really wonderfully executed. No, oh, thank you. I mean, that's also massive, uh, you know, massively helped by the band, The National, who wrote um, all the music and lyrics and, and their music has a kind of contemplative mm-hmm. um uh emotionality the the yearning and and it's not kind of you know it's not um uh i was about to say another film there um it's not um it's not 80s musicals <laughs> got it exactly fair enough fair fair enough now when is uh when is here no uh, being released and where can people see it um it is being released um on uh it's being released on on january 21st um in you know selected theaters and then goes wide on february the 4th okay and i'm gonna ask you a few questions i ask all of my guests what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today oh god i mean i think we've covered that haven't we Um, (laughs) i think we might have (laughs) uh, uh i mean you know um yeah as i said earlier find actors go that's to a great a, piece of advice yeah. fringe theater go to you know there's a little room upstairs uh of a pub um go and put a show on uh what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life i'm enough you know what that is one of the most common answers it, it, out of all everybody yeah. has it, it a lot of people that's a that's a lesson that a lot of people have learned it's fascinating um, that and patience I, yeah i still haven't learned it frankly <laughs> but yeah that's a lesson i'm i'm continuing to try and learn it's always that and patience patience is the other big one that a lot of people have to learn still yeah yeah maybe <laughs> yeah maybe we've all read the same self-help books but yeah <laughs> and lastly three of your favorite films of all time uh well, I can't even begin to <laughs> break my favorite films into just three. So I'll just come with three off the top of my head. Um, uh, see, I can't even do that. Um, <laughs> you right, could do directors so too, if you like. <laughs> I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be clever. I shouldn't be clever. I should just tell you what the films that... A Brief Encounter by David Lean. Okay. Um, uh, 
Fellini's Amacord mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, Visconti's The Leopard. Amazing lists are amazing lists joe thank you so much for being on the show uh it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you it was so much fun please continue making movies uh you 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 are needed in the cinematic uh world so i truly truly appreciate you my friend bless you i want to thank joe for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the show today thank you so much joe if you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode including how to see his new film Cyrano, which, by the way, I have seen, and it is fantastic. It is a wonderful retelling of a classic, classic story. Head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 172. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly, truly helps us out a lot. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 